fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing nuclear and cytoplasmic staining and the histopathology laboratory. All right, let's get started. Cells were first discovered and named in the year 1665 by a man that was named Robert Hooke. He was looking at a cork under a microscope and noticed them in uh, a piece of cork. So he named them cells because they reminded him of um, what looked like prison cells. In 1838, um, a, a man named Matthias Scheidelin determined that the cell was the basic structural unit of vegetable matter. So this man was actually a botanist, um, so this is why he declared it in vegetable matter. The following year, um, a man named Theodore Schwann determined that cells were organisms and they made up animals and plants. So we know today that cells are divided into two major parts, the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So the structure on the right hand side here shows um, a cartoon um, of a cell. So in the middle here is the nucleus and surrounding that, so all of this basically is the cytoplasm. The cell's nucleus is a membrane bound organelle that contains the cell's genetic material. It's also responsible for regulating the cell's activity. It contains a nuclear membrane, nuclear pores, a nucleolus, and a chromatin. How a nucleus appears depends on whether it is resting or going through mitosis, which is the fancy term for uh, dividing. So when stained with the H&E stain, which we'll discuss more about in this lecture, the nucleus appears as a membrane bound dark blue to purple mass. And when they are this color, we call them basophilic. This is a photograph of simple columnar epithelial cells of the pancreatic duct. So the arrow is pointing to a row of nuclei. So see how dark purple uh, or dark blue they are. Um, so these are the nuclei, uh, which is the plural term for nucleus. So those are basophilic, dark blue or, or purple color. The nuclear membrane is part of the nucleus, specifically um, it encloses the nucleus. So it's a double layer membrane and sometimes those membranes come together to form something called a nuclear pore. Nuclear membranes can be seen with an electron microscope. They usually stain a crisp dark blue color with aluminum hematoxylin solutions. So I mentioned nuclear pores on the last slide. So these are channels in the nuclear membrane that regulate uh, molecular transport between the cell's nucleus and its cytoplasm. Uh, these are also visible using electron microscopy. The nucleolus is a rounded structure within the nucleus that provides and assembles ribosomes. Uh, so it's also the location of ribosomal RNA transcription. This is a usually very basophilic structure, um, but can appear acidophilic with the H&E stain. So this is visible with both the electron microscope and the light microscope. The photo on the right hand side of the slide shows the nucleolus as denoted by this black arrow, arrow and this is um, a neuron tissue section. Chromatin is a mixture of proteins and DNA that form the cell's chromosomes in the nucleus. There is stainable chromatin called heterochromatin and non-stainable chromatin called euchromatin. So heterochromatin has a lot of condensed regions and stains very basophilic or that dark blue to purple color. It can be seen in light microscopy. Euchromatin makes up the genetically active part of the chromosome. And again, it doesn't stain and it's not visible with light microscopy. So those were the components of a cell's nucleus. The cytoplasm is the gelatinous fluid that is inside the cell. It's composed of water, salts, and organelles. So again, uh, let's get my pointer right here. This is the nucleus, okay? Um, and all of this around here is the cytoplasm. And you can see these structures here, just kind of like all over in the cytoplasm. All right, so these are called organelles. And these include the plasma lemma, mitochondria, ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, centrioles, and lysosomes. 
So the amount of cytoplasm as well as the appearance of the cytoplasm is helpful in determining the type of cell type. All right, so let's talk about those organelles. So the plasma lemma is also called the plasma membrane. This is made of a phospholipid bilayer and surrounds the contents of the cell. The plasma lemma is visible with the electron microscope as three different layers. So two of these layers appear dark and one appears light with that, that electron microscope. So because of these three layers, it's often referred to as a trimelar membrane. These are not seen in H and E stain sections, but are important in reactions of antigens and antibodies. The mitochondria is commonly referred to as the energy powerhouse of the cell. So this is a membrane bound organelle that produces energy ver uh, via oxidative reactions. Mitochondria are not visible on H and E uh, stain sections. Ribosomes are the site of the production of proteins. So some ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, which is another organelle within the cytoplasm, and some are just free floating. Ribosomes cause a blue color seen in the cytoplasm of some cell types. The endoplasmic reticulum is a series of membrane bound channels that provide transport for secretory products within the cell. There are two types of endoplasmic reticulum, rough and smooth. The rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes that are attached to it. H and E stain sections show a basophilic color in the cytoplasm of these cells. And remember basophilic is that dark blue uh, purple color. An example of this is in plasma cells. So all cells but mature red blood cells um, have some rough endoplasmic reticulum. So the photo on the right hand side of this slide shows the basophilic color and the cytoplasm of plasma cells. So um, that arrow there shows you um, a, a plasma cell. You see how kind of dark blue and purple it is. So uh, that's what we're talking about. The Golgi apparatus is an organelle that concentrates the protein made by ribosomes and then packages them for transport. The Golgi apparatus stays close to the nucleus and does not stain with the H and E stain. This unstained area can appear as a paranuclear halo. So this is uh, common in plasma cells. So the photo on the right hand side of this slide is a plasma cell in the peripheral bloodstream. And this is actually um, stained with right games of stain. Um, we, we look at peripheral blood um, in medical laboratory technology or medical laboratory science. Um, but this does show you what we're talking about here. So if you see around here, there's just kind of like a, a clearing around that nucleus in comparison to this, which is a little bit darker. That's a paranuclear halo, and that is actually um, the Golgi apparatus. Centrioles come in pairs and are responsible for the spindle formation in the cell's division process. These cannot be seen with the H and E stain. Lysosomes are organelles that are part of the defensive mechanisms of the body. They also serve as a means of digestion of nutrients that are taken into the cell. The lysosome surrounds digestible material, the membranes fuse, and the contents mix together. Anything that is not digested is retained and referred to as residual bodies. Cells like neurons, cardiac muscle, and liver cells, which are also called hepatocytes, tend to accumulate a large amount of these residual bodies. These accumulations are called lipofusion, and these appear yellow to brown un under a light microscope. Staining reactions involve both physical factors and chemical factors. Ionic bonding happens when the dye used and the substance that is supposed to be dyed develop different charges and become attracted to each other. Hydrogen bonding is when a hydrogen molecule is attracted to atoms with a strong electronegative charge. This is a weak bond and can form between the dye and the water. Covalent bonds occur when atoms share their electrons. This occurs frequently in organic chemicals. And then van der Waals forces are created by the electrostatic attraction of molecules to electrons. Nuclear staining, so how we stain the nucleus of the cell, is not understood very well, uh, but it is thought to occur through two different mechanisms. So the first being done with basic dyes, so these are dyes that have a positive charge, also called cationic uh, dyes. This is dependent on the DNA and RNA in the nucleus to form dye salt type unions. The second mechanism is done with dyes um, 
combined with metal mordants or followed by metal mordants. And recall that mordants are metallic salts, metal ion containing natural compounds or other complex forming agents that are used to improve the uptake of the dye. So this mechanism occurs in tissue where both DNA and RNA are removed through the decalcification process. The term basophilic or base loving is used for acidic tissues that take up basic dyes. This term is not correct for the metal mordant mechanism of staining. Many of the same types of tissues are stained with the metal mordant mechanism of staining, but sometimes they stain substances that don't have acidic groups. So for example, um, mucopolysaccharides that do not have a charge and also myelin. Also with aluminum uh, hematoxylins um, should not be associated with um, uh, the term basophilia or basophilic. Uh, for these instances, the term uh, metallophilia or metallophilic is used. So this term is appropriate for tissues that induce staining with the metal mordant complexes. There are many forces responsible for the binding of metal uh, hematian uh, by nuclei. It is not fully understood, but likely that both ionic and hydrogen bonding are involved, as well as hydrophobic forces and van der Waals forces as well. We have a much better understanding of the mechanism of the staining of the cytoplasm of the cell. The staining is due to proteins or to charge groups on the side chains of amino acids that make up those proteins. Proteins that make up amino acids have a terminal amino group, which is written as NH2, and a terminal, a terminal carboxyl group, which is written as COOH. These two groups cause the protein to be either positively or negatively charged. The charge is based on the pH, so in an electrical field, the charge determines how the protein migrates. When there is a net positive charge, meaning that there is a more positive than negative charge, the protein migrates to something called uh, the cathode. And the cathode is a negatively charged electrode in an electrical field. When there is a net negative charge, meaning that there is more negative than positive charge, uh, the protein migrates to something we call the anode. So the anode is a positively charged electrode uh, within the electrical field. Now, when there is an equal amount of positive and negative charges, there is no migration of the proteins. And this is called the isoelectric point or IEP. The IEP of proteins is around the pH of six. Below the IEP, the net charge on the proteins is positive and the attraction is for an anionic dye. Above the IEP, the net charge on the proteins is negative and it attracts cationic dyes. Those that attract basic dyes are re uh, referred to as basophilic and those that attract acidic dyes are referred to as acidophilic. So let's talk about the dyes that we use in the histopathology laboratory. These are organic compounds. Most of them are coal tar or derivatives of benzene. There are three different terms here that are important chromophore, chromogen, and oxochrome. A chromophore is a chemical group that determines the color. So there are many different chromophores, but they all are easily reduced. And this is because they have a high affinity for hydrogen, meaning they really wanna hang out with hydrogen. So if they are reduced, the chromophore is no more and there will be no color. Now a chromogen is a benzene derivative, meaning it comes down from benzene that contains chromophoric groups. Now, just because a compound contains chromophores doesn't mean that it has the ability to be a dye. Oxochromes are required in order for a dye to color a tissue. A confusing concept about dyes is when referring to them, uh, pH doesn't have anything to do with the term basic dyes and acidic dyes. So basic dyes are those that have a positive charge. These dyes are also called cationic dyes. The basic oxochrome group is the amino group. Most are chloride salts. Uh, crystal violet and safranin are examples of basic or cationic dyes. Acidic dyes are those that have a negative charge. So these dyes are also called anionic dyes. Their oxychromes are sulfonic, carboxyl, and hydroxyl groups. Most are sodium salts. Orange G and picric acids are examples of acidic or anionic dyes. Only a few natural dyes are used in the histopathology lab. The most common natural dyes are carmine, orsian, saffron, and hematoxylin. Uh, some of these can also be produced synthetically, but carmine is uh, derived from uh, cochineal bugs, orsian is derived from lichens, uh, saffron is derived from the crocus flower, which you can see in this photo here, 
and hematoxylin is from the heartwood of a logwood tree. So what kinds of things affect the binding of dye to tissue? The pH of a solution can affect it. If the temperature is increased, the rate of staining will also increase. This is because an increase of temperature will cause the tissue to swell. Also, as the concentration of the dye increases, so does the binding of the dye. Depending on the components of the tissue, salts can increase or decrease the intensity of the stain. This is due to the competition between salt ions and the dye ions trying to bind to the tissue. I'm going to be using the terms progressive staining and regressive staining. So most stains are used progressively. So this term means that once the tissue reaches a certain intensity of color while staining, that staining process is stopped. Mordic dyes commonly require regressive staining. So regressive staining is when the tissue is overstained and then differentiated or decolorized until only the desired part of the tissue is left stained. And recall, mordants are substances or metals that help to combine dye and tissue. There are three ways of differentiation or decolorization in the regressive staining process. The first way is differentiating or decolorizing basic, also called cationic dyes, by weak acid solutions, or differentiating or decolorizing acidic also called anionic dyes, by weak alkaline solutions. So an example of this is differentiating aluminum hematoxylins with a diluted hydrochloric acid. Now the second way is any excess of mordant will break that tissue mordant dye complex. The third way is oxidizing. So oxidizers oxidize the dye to a colorless substance. Examples of oxidizing differentiators are potassium permanganate and chromium trioxide. All right, so let's talk about some nuclear dyes. So hematoxylin is the most commonly used nuclear stain. This is taken from the logwood tree. The wood uh, from this tree when freshly cut does not have any color, but it does turn a reddish brown when exposed to oxygen. So the, this oxidized dye is a hematian. Uh, so don't get this confused with hematin. So hematin are deposits like formalin pigment or acid hematin. Hematian is a weak anionic dye that is formed from the oxidation of hematoxylin. So this oxidation of hematoxylin must happen and can occur just naturally by exposing it to oxygen or by using oxidizing agents such as uh, sodium iodate, uh, potassium permanganate, and mercuric oxide. This oxidizing process is called ripening. Delafield and Ehrlich hematoxylins are naturally ripened, so ripened by being exposed to oxygen. And Harris, Mayer, and Gill hematoxylins are chemically oxidized, so oxidized by the use of an oxidizer. Oxidized hematoxylin, or hematian, has little affinity for tissue. And what this means is it has little interest in combining with the tissue. So now when it's combined with a metallic mordant, it becomes very strongly attracted to that nucleus. And this, this attraction allows it to dye that nucleus or stain that nucleus. The combination of the mordant and the dye is referred to as a lake. Uh, the most common hematoxylin lakes are combinations of hematian and aluminum or hematian and iron. Routine nuclear stains are called aluminum uh, hematians um, because aluminum is the mordant that's used. These are Harris hematoxylin, Delafield hematoxylin, Mayer hematoxylin, Ehrlich hematoxylin, Gill hematoxylin, uh, Weigert hematoxylin, and Celestine blue. And we're going to talk about all of these now. Harris hematoxylin is created by dissolving 5 grams of hematoxylin and 50 milliliters of absolute ethyl alcohol. 20 milliliters of water may, need, uh, may be needed to um, dissolve the entire amount of hematoxylin, but it's not necessarily required. Then 100 grams of ammonium aluminum sulfate needs to be dissolved in 1,000 milliliters of water. Those two solutions then need to be mixed together. Once mixed, the solution must be brought to a boil quickly and then removed from the heat source. Two and a half grams of mercuric oxide must then slowly be added. After that addition of mercuric oxide, um, the uh, solution must then be boiled for two to three minutes until it becomes a dark purple in color. Once that dark purple color is achieved, it must be removed from that heat source and put into a container of ice. 
And this stain is ready to use as soon as a metallic sheen forms on the top of the solution once it's put in that ice. Now before using, it must be filtered and glacial acetic acid must be added to give a final concentration of 4%. Now the mordant in Harris hematoxylin is um, aluminum. Uh, the chemical ripening agent, so what oxidizes it, is mercuric oxide. Uh, sodium iodide can also be used for the oxidation process as well. Now this is most frequently used as a progressive stain uh, for one to three minutes to, to give really consistent staining of the nucleus. Now for very selective nuclear staining it's recommended to acidify that Harris hematoxylin solution using 1% hydrochloric acid to a pH of 1 to 1.2. Now, Delafield hematoxylin. So there is a solution A and a solution B used for this. So for uh, to make solution A, um, 180 milligrams of ammonium aluminum sulfate is combined with 1,000 milliliters of distilled water. It's dissolved uh, with heat and then allowed to cool. And once that solution is cooled, um, the aluminum will crystallize and settle to the bottom of the flask that's used. Now the supernatant will be saturated in what we're gonna to use to mix with solution B. Now solution B is created with four grams of hematoxylin combined with 25 milliliters of 95% alcohol. The hematoxylin is dissolved um, in that alcohol. Now 400 milliliters of solution A is then mixed with 25 milliliters of that solution B. And this mixed solution is then exposed to sunlight in a cotton plug bottle for around three to four days. After that time frame, the solution is then filtered and 100 milliliters of glycerol and 100 milliliters of 95% ethyl alcohol is added. The resulting solution must then sit for three to six months in light before using. Now the mordant in the, this Delafield hematoxylin is aluminum and you might have guessed, but the oxidation occurs naturally with exposure to light and oxygen. This stain is used regressively the alcohol in the solution is actually a preservative and the addition of glycerol provides stabilization against over oxidation and evaporation of the solution. Now there are a few ways to tell if this solution is ready for use. Uh, hematoxylin has a whiny smell and is a deep purple red in color. Uh, when it is dropped into tap water, it turns bluish black in color. And if a drop is put on filter paper, uh, that drop should be maroon in color with a purple edge around it. Now, if the purple edge is not visible, this means that the stain is not oxidized enough and not ready to be used. Mayer hematoxylin is created by combining one gram of hematoxylin with 1000 milliliters of distilled water. The hematoxylin is dissolved in the water, then the solution is boiled for five minutes. After that five minute period elapses, the solution is removed from that heat source. Once the boiling has stopped, 0.2 grams of sodium iodate is added to oxidize it. It needs to be let ripened for 10 minutes, and remember ripened means to oxidize. Then 50 grams of ammonium or potassium aluminum sulfate is added and dissolved. Then one gram of citric acid is added and dissolved. Then 50 grams of chloral hydrate is added and dissolved. In Mayer hematoxylin, uh, aluminum is the mordant and the sodium iodate serves as the chemical oxidizer. The citric acid and chloral hydrate helps to prevent scum and precipitates from forming. Mayer hematoxylin is used for immunoperoxidase techniques with 3 amino 9 ethyl carbazole um, when uh, is used as a chromogen. This is because Mayer hematoxylin doesn't contain alcohol, which will dissolve the reaction product of this technique. This stain is used progressively and can be uh, slower in routine nuclear staining. Um, even though it is slower in that routine nuclear staining, it is difficult to overstain the sections uh, using this type of hematoxylin. Ehrlich uh, hematoxylin is created by dissolving 2 grams of hematoxylin and 100 milliliters of 95% alcohol. Once fully dissolved, 100 milliliters uh, distilled water, 100 milliliters of glycerol, 3 grams ammonium or potassium aluminum sulfate, and 10 milliliters of glacial acetic acid are added. The mordant in this solution is the aluminum, and it can be oxidized by adding 0.4 grams of sodium iodate or it can be placed in a cotton plug bottle for two weeks. 
Uh, Ehrlich uh, hematoxylin is used as a regressive stain. Gale hematoxylin 1 is created by combining 2 grams of anhydrous hematoxylin with 730 milliliters of distilled water with 250 milliliters ethylene glycol, 0.2 grams of sodium iodate, 17.6 uh, grams of aluminum sulfate, and 20 milliliters of glacial acetic acid. The ethylene glycol that is added helps to prevent the formation of precipitates in this solution. Gill hematoxylin can be used uh, immediately, but does work better if allowed to fully ripen or oxidize for one week um, in a 37 degree incubator. Aluminum is the mordant and sodium iodate is the oxidizer. So most consistent uh, results happen when using the stain progressively, although some labs use it regressively. This hematoxylin is marked, marketed in three different strengths. Gill 2 and 3 are used for staining tissues, with 3 being the most concentrated, and this Gill 3 can be used for staining of glycol methoacrylate sections. Gill 2 can be prepared by doubling the amount of hematoxylin to 4 grams and the sodium iodate to 0.4 grams, and then quadrupling, quadrupling the aluminum sulfate used in the above formula. Gill hematoxylin will stain goblet cells, which are uh, mucosal epithelial cells uh, that are present in the intestine. Hematoxylin stains are prone to developing a metallic sheen of oxidized dye on the surface, which needs to be filtered before using. If this isn't filtered, um, a bluish black precipitate will be seen on the stained sections. Mayer and Gill hematoxylin are not prone to form the sheen, so that's a good thing. Uh, this is because of the acetic acid present, uh, which prevents this. Now, the color of the solution is an indicator of the freshness of the aluminum mordant. With fresh mordant, a blue solution is seen. And as the mordant ages, it changes to red and then brown. Any nuclei that are stained with this aging solution will be brown rather than blue in color. If nuclear staining with a hematoxylin stain indicates the need for differentiation, so this is if the stain was used regressively, the sections are blued. This is done with weakly alkaline solutions, dilute lithium carbonate, ammonium hydroxide, or Scott solution. And these are examples of bluing agents. Uh, these bluing agents changes uh, the pH when, um, which changes the solubility of the dye lake. So the aluminum uh, hematin um, a complex is uh, red. Uh, the bluing converts this red to a more desirable uh, blue lake that is insoluble in usual staining solutions. Sometimes iron hematoxylin can be used for staining the nucleus of the cells. It resists decolorization in acidic staining solutions. Ferric chloride is a strong oxidizer and serves as both the mordant and oxidizer for Weigert hematoxylin, which is a progressive stain. There are two solutions used in the preparation of Weigert hematoxylin. Solution A is prepared by combining 4 milliliters of 29% ferric chloride with 95 milliliters distilled water and 1 milliliter of concentrated hydrochloric acid. Solution B is prepared by combining one gram of hematoxylin with 100 grams of 95% alcohol. Solution A and solution B are mixed in equal parts, and this can be used for two to three days. Celestine blue may be substituted for hematoxylin in the H&E procedure and gives identical results to this. Again, the use of Weigert hematoxylin is used progressively for uh, five to 30 minutes. I mentioned celestine blue on the previous slide. So this is created by dissolving one gram of celestine blue and 100 milliliters of distilled water. Four grams of ferric ammonium sulfate should be dissolved in 100 milliliters of distilled water as well. Once um, both of these solutions are completely dissolved and mixed, the two solutions should be mixed together. Uh, this celestine blue should be a dark blue in color and should be filtered before it is used. Celestine blue is used is a substitute in iron hematoxylin methods to stain the nucleus. So we just talked about the nuclear stain, so let's talk a little bit about plasma stains. So these are most commonly negatively charged uh, anionic dyes that combine with positively charged cationic tissues. Arginine, histidine, and lysine are amino acids that are most commonly the sites for dye binding. The two plasma stains that we're going to be discussing are eosin solution and eosin floxine B. 
ESN solution is prepared by mixing 200 milliliters of ESN Y, 600 milliliters of 95% ethyl alcohol, and 4 milliliters of glacial acetic acid. This is the most widely used counter stain in routine section staining. The best staining with ESN occurs when at a pH of 4.6 to 5. If used correctly, ESN can achieve at least three different shades of pink. Examples include red blood cells, collagen, and muscle or epithelial cytoplasm, which all stain different shades of pink. The solution must remain acidic in order to provide the proper charge on the proteins. Eosin floxine, eosin floxine B is prepared by mixing 100 milliliters of eosin Y with 10 milliliters of floxine B, 780 milliliters of 95% alcohol, and 5 milliliters of glacial acetic acid. This eosin stain provides a more vivid pink shade. Now these two photos show the differences between when acid is added to the eosin solution versus not adding that acid. The photo on the left hand side shows um, a small intestine section that is counterstained with eosin that has the glacial acetic acid present. This glacial acetic acid ensures that the pH stays between 4.6 to 5. Now the photo on the right hand side of this slide is also a small intestine section that was counterstained with eosin that does not have glacial acetic acid added to it. Because that glacial acetic acid was not added, the pH was above the isoelectric point of the protein, so it wasn't within that 4.6 to 5 range. Now the photo on the right hand side shows a reduction in the uptake of the eosin stain. So this shows why adding acetic acid is important in the eosin solution. The hematoxylin and eosin stain, referred to as the H&E stain, is the most commonly used stain in the histopathology laboratory. It combines both hematoxylin and eosin, hence the name of course. Uh, Harris hematoxylin is the preferred hematoxylin for this stain. It can be used progressively or regressively. The progressive method of the H&E stain is performed by doing three changes of xylene, and each step of those xylene needs to be two minutes each, uh, 10 dips in absolute alcohol, two changes of 95% alcohol at 10 dips each, so each of those changes is going to be 10 dips in that 95% alcohol, uh, then rinsing it in tap water. Um, if you're using uh, Mayer hematoxylin, it needs to be in there for 15 minutes. Um, if using Harris hematoxylin with acetic acid, um, one to three minutes for that step. Uh, then two changes in tap water with 10 dips each, uh, so a total of 20. Um, then the next step is either 0.25% ammonia water or 0.5% lithium carbonate until the solution turns blue. Then two changes of tap water, again, at 10 dips each. And then 10 to 20 dips of eosin, or if using eosin floxine, uh, that's a one to three minute step. Uh, then two changes of 95% alcohol, and each of those changes needs to be 10 to 15 dips each in that 95% alcohol. Then three changes of absolute alcohol with 10 to 15 dips in that absolute alcohol each of those changes. Then three changes in xylene, which is um, actually 10 to 15 dips each time um, in those three changes. Now the water in this should be changed frequently and the slides must remain in the last container until a cover slip is applied to them. It is very important here to not agitate the slides in the ammonia water as this can cause section loss. So that's the progressive method of H&E staining. The regressive method of the H&E stain is performed by um, doing three changes of xylene at two minutes each, and then dipping it 10 times in al absolute alcohol, then two changes of 95% alcohol at 10 dips each. So each of those changes is 10 dips in that 95% alcohol, then rinsing it with tap water, and then uh, 10 to 15 minutes in hematoxylin, um, either Delafield, Ehrlich, or Harris without acetic acid. Then two changes of tap water at 10 dips each of, for each of those changes. Then five to 10 dips in hydrochloric acid. Then a running water wash. Then 30 seconds of 0.25% ammonia water or 0.5% lithium carbonate then 10 dips each uh, at water changes, so two times, so two tap water changes at 10 dips each, 
then one to 20 dips of eosin or eosin floxine. If, if, you, if you're using um, eosin, you want to do one to 20 dips. And then if you're using eosin floxine, it's one to three minutes. Then two changes of 95% alcohol. So each of those change gets 10 dips of it. And then um, three changes of absolute alcohol at 10 dips each. So each of those changes gets 10 dips and then absolute alcohol. Then three changes of xylene and each of those changes consists of 10 dips uh, each. So the water should also be changed frequently. And of course, the slides must remain in the last container until a cover slip is applied to them. It is important to not agitate the slides in the bluing agent uh, step as this can cause section loss. Slides should be checked with the microscope to ensure that the process is completed correctly. The left-hand side photo shows an H&E stain appendix section. This is properly stained and shows blue nuclei with well-defined nuclear membranes. The photo on the right hand side is the same specimen that has been H&E stained, but over stained. So there's a loss of differentiation between non-nuclear elements and the contrast between the nuclei and the cytoplasm is not as clear and crisp in those on the left hand side photograph. So here are some tips about the H&E stain that Dr. Carson recommends. So the first one is that following staining, one slide from each basket should be checked under the microscope to ensure that the stain is proper. Now, that's of course if you're doing the stains manually. If using an automated stainer, a control slide should be stained to ensure that the automated stainer is working properly. A gray tissue section to use for this control for this is um, small intestine tissue. Um, also, at no point during the staining process should the sections be allowed to dry. When not in use, all solutions must be kept covered, um, and this prevents evaporation and potential contamination of those solutions. The histopathology lab should follow a routine um, schedule for changing out solutions. Um, this should be based on the number of slides the laboratory stains a day. Now, after you apply ammonia water, it is important to wash the sections with tap water. Excess ammonia can cause pH issues with the eosin stain. Now slides should also not be passed too quickly through the dehydrating solutions. Now if there are tissues that have uh, needed to have been fixed for a longer amount of time than normal, they may require an increased staining time. Depending on the fixatives used for the tissue, staining times may need to be adjusted. For example, if the tissue was fixed in Heli, Zanker, or B5 fixatives, the time in the hematoxylin stain may need to be increased and the time in the eosin stain may need to be decreased. If a xylene substitute is being used, it's important to follow the manufacturer's guidelines for it. You will notice that running tap water is a part of the H&E stain process, so for both uh, the regressive and progressive stain. So some tap water may not be suitable for this. So iron, sulfur, and chlorine in the tap water can produce weakened stain of the nucleus. So the water should be checked, and if needed, DI or distilled water can be used, although it is not preferred for the H&E stain. Uh, lastly, sometimes what looks like a staining problem might not actually be a staining problem. So if you cannot uh, easily identify an issue as a staining problem, go ahead and stain sections from the previous day that were acceptable and see if they're staining well um, on the day that you're having issues. So, and if they are staining well, then it probably isn't a staining problem. So fixation time, the use of heat, and carryover uh, formalin can all cause issues. So it may not be the stain at all. Histotex can manually stain slides using the H&E stain, but there are commercially available automated H&E stainers. Uh, these use the progressive method of staining and transferred slides from one container of solution to the next for a designated period of time. An example of an automated stainer is featured here on this slide, on the picture on the right-hand side. Uh, so this is um, an automated stainer from the company called Leica. Frozen sections can be stained with the H&E stain. The procedure for this is as follows. So cut the frozen section and fix in 37 to 40% formaldehyde for 20 seconds. Then rinse with three changes of tap water. Um, then add Harris hematoxylin with acetic acid um, and have this um, on there for one to one and a half minutes. Then rinse with two changes of tap water. 
um, then add 0.25% um, ammonia water until the solution turns blue. At that point, you want to rinse with two changes of tap water and then stain in ESN about 15 to 20 dips in that ESN. At this point, you want to dehydrate with 95% alcohol and absolute alcohol. So you want um, 10 dips in the two changes of each alcohol. Then you want to clear it with xylene. Um, so in three changes, so 10 dips per change. And then afterwards, you want to mount with a synthetic resin. So many errors can happen with H&E stains. So it's important to know how to identify these errors by how they look, what causes these errors, and also how to correct them. So the first issue is when white spots or incomplete staining is present in the section after the deparaffinization step. So you can see these white spots on this section here on this right-hand side of uh, the slide. So all this white here. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, this is caused by the section not being dried properly prior to being deparaffinized. So either that or the slide did not remain in the xylene long enough for the removal of all that paraffin. Areas that still contain paraffin are unable to be penetrated by the stain, resulting in these white areas. So if this happens, it must be treated with absolute alcohol to remove the water present and then treated again with xylene to remove all of the paraffin. If the spots were caused by not being in xylene an appropriate length of time, uh, they should be put uh, into xylene. Then they should be decolorized and then restained. Another error that can occur with the H&E stain is when the nuclei that are present are too pale. So you can see an example of this in the photo here. So this is a fallopian tube section, and um, you can see that the nuclei are really pale in it, so there's no blue present at all. So this can be caused by three different things. So the first thing is that it could not have not been stained long enough in the hematoxylin stain. Second, uh, the hematoxylin could have been over oxidized and should not have been used in the first place. And it also could have been uh, differentiated too long. So if pale nuclei are present in bone sections, um, uh, this can also be the result of over decalcification of the specimen. So if this occurs, the section must be restained. The nuclei can be overstained with H&E stain, as you can see here in this photograph. So this is a section of skin tissue. The cytoplasm contains some he hematoxylin stain, and the contrast between it and the nuclei is very poor. So this error can be caused by three different things. So first, being kept too long in the hematoxylin stain. Um, also having too thick of a section or having too short of a differentiation step. So if the section is the proper thickness, it can be decolorized and then restained to correct for this. If the overstained nuclei are caused by the section being too thick, it must be recut. If the nuclei have a red brownish color to them, this means either the hematoxylin is breaking down or the sections were not blued enough. So the correction for this is to allow a longer time for bluing. So you can't over blue the sections. Uh, additionally, the oxidation status of the hematoxylin must be checked. And if it's you know, over, oxidase, uh, over oxidized, you need to get rid of it and start with new hematoxylin. If the section has pale ESN staining, this can be caused by the pH being greater than five. It could have been uh, left too long in the dehydrating solution or the tissue section might have been too thin. If it's caused by a pH issue, acetic acid should be added to get it to a pH of 4.6 to 5. Ensure that the bluing agent is removed fully before transferring this section to the eosin stain. The cytoplasm can be overstained, so this can be attributed to the eosin uh, being too concentrated. It can also mean that the tissue section was stained for too long or that it was not put through the dehydrating alcohols long enough for good differentiation to occur. So depending on the cause, the solutions for this can be diluting that eosin solution if it's too concentrated, uh, decreasing the amount of time the tissue section uh, is in the stain, or allowing more time for the section to be exposed to the, those dehydrating solutions. Sometimes a blue-black uh, precipitate can be found on the section. So you can see it clearly in this photo of brain tissue. So this is what I'm talking about, all these like 
blue black precipitates there. So this is caused um, by the metallic sheen precipitate that forms in a lot of hematoxylin solutions. Um, and so this precipitate is being picked up and then put on the slide. So this can be prevented by filtering the hematoxylin solution daily. If there is a hazy or milky water in slide, um, this can be caused by xylene being present on the slides when placed in the water following alcohol during the deparaffinization de step. Uh, this can be prevented or corrected by backing the slides up and changing alcohols, then taking them through absolute and 95% alcohols to water. When this occurs right before applying the cover glass, this means there is water still present on the slides, meaning the dehydration step was not complete. This can be prevented and corrected by backing the slides up and changing the alcohol and xylene, and then rehydrating and clearing the tissue sections. There can be dark basophilic staining, so that dark blue um, color of nuclei and cytoplasm, especially around the edges. Um, so techniques with laser and electrocauterization um, can denature macromolecules in the tissue. And this can produce what we call a, a, as a heat artifact, as you can see in this photo on the right hand side of the slide. So let me show you right here is what I'm talking about. So this is visible as marked dark basophilic staining, so usually at the very edge of the tissue. It kind of looks like a burned area of the tissue. So there is no correction for this artifact once it occurs. We can also stain nucleic acids. So deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, is found in the nucleus, and it makes up the nuclear chromatin. Ribonucleic acid, or RNA, is found in the nucleolus and in the cell's ribosomes. So both DNA and RNA are those nucleic acids. So these are not stained in routine histopathology laboratories, um, but there are two methods that we can use for their staining. Uh, the Fulgen reaction is used for staining of DNA, and the methyl green pyranin method is used for staining both DNA and RNA. The first nucleic acid stain we will be discussing is the Fulgen reaction. So in this reaction, hydrochloric acid mildly hydrolyzes DNA and removes the purine bases from that DNA molecule. It does leave the sugars and phosphates of the molecules intact. So this reaction causes an aldehyde group that can be shown with the Schiff reagent. So any fixative can be used in tissues that are being stained with the Fulgen reaction, except Buin fixative. So this is because the Buin solution breaks down the nuclei um, during fixation. So a quality control section is not needed for this reaction, as all uh, nuclei will give a positive reaction with it. So tissue sections for this reaction should be cut at 5 microns in length. The procedure for the Fulgen reaction is as follows. So the 5 micron um, tissue section should be deparaffinized in xylene, then hydrated in two changes of absolute alcohol, two changes in 95% alcohol, and then in distilled water. The section should then be rinsed in cold uh, hydrochloric acid preheated and maintained at 60 degrees Celsius for the following time. So if the tissue has been fixed in formalin, it should be rinsed for 8 to 12 minutes. If the tissue is zanker or heli fixed, it should be rinsed for 5 to 8 minutes. So it depends on what type of fixative you're using for this. At this point, it should then be rinsed in cold hydrochloric acid and then distilled water. Then the tissue should be stained in Schiff reagent for a one hour period. So after this one hour time, um, the tissue should then be washed, then rinsed in three changes of freshly prepped sulfur sulfurous acid. Uh, so this step should be performed under a fume hood. So the section should then be washed in running tap water for a period of five minutes. If desired, the tissue can then be counterstained with 1% aqueous light green. It should then be dehydrated, cleared, and mounted with a synthetic resin. If properly stained, the DNA should appear reddish purple in color and the cytoplasm, if of course counterstained, should be light green. So recall in the previous slide I mentioned that the counterstain with 1% aqueous light green, so this is an optional step, but if it is performed, it stains the cytoplasm that light green color. So the photograph in the left-hand side of the slide shows a lymph node section that is stained using the Fulgen reaction. The DNA is a bright rose red here. 
So there's no counter stain used um, in the section on this photo. On the right hand side photograph, you can see a lymph node that is stained with the Fulton reaction. The difference here is that it has been counter stained. So you can see this with the light green color of the cytoplasm in this section. These two photos show issues that can occur with the Fulgen reaction. So the photo on the left hand side here um, shows when the hydrolysis step of the reaction is either underdone or overdone. Um, this causes the aldehydes to not be demonstrated with the shift reagent and the stain. The photo on the right hand side shows what it looks like when too much counter stain is applied in the stain. The section is also too, uh, cut too thickly. The other nucleic acid stain is methyl green pyranin Y. So this method is used to differentiate between the cell's DNA and RNA. And most specifically, it's most commonly used for identifying uh, plasma cells and immunoblasts with tissue samples. The preferred fixative is 10% neutral buffered formalin, although B5, heli, or zanker fixatives are acceptable for this method of staining. When using this stain, it should be QC'd. And when I say that, I mean it needs a form of quality control to ensure that the stain is working as intended. The QC for this should be paraffin embedded tissue that contains many plasma cells and is fixed in a formalin fixative. The tissue sections for this stain should be cut to four microns. The procedure for this staining method is as follows. You want to deparaffinize in silene, then hydrate in two changes of absolute alcohol, two changes of 95% alcohol, and then distilled water. You need to stain one slide at a time with this using a pasture pipette to flood the slide with that methyl uh, green pyranin Y solution, and you want to let it sit for about a five minute period. Rinse uh, then with distilled water and blot and dry uh, with filter paper. So you want to make sure that it's completely dry. Then uh, you want to do two changes of acetone, and each of those changes needs to be 15 quick dips. And then dip in equal parts of acetone and xylene uh, with 15 quick dips in that. Then you want to dip in two changes of xylene, and each of those changes needs to be 15 dips. And then you want to um, let it remain in that last change of xylene for five minutes. And after that period, you want to mount using a synthetic resin. If properly stained, the DNA and nuclei should be green to blue, uh, blue green in color. So uh, RNA should be red or like a rose color. Goblet cells, if present, are mint green. Uh, the background should be colorless to pale pink. And any immunoblast or plasma cell should stain very intensely red. This slide shows two photographs of tissues that are stained with methyl green pyranin Y. The photo on the left hand side of the slide shows the red stain of the RNA and the blue to greenish color staining of the DNA. There's no background staining in this photo. The photograph on the right hand side of the slide shows the RNA and DNA differentiated from each other. So RNA stains that red rosy color and the DNA stains that blue to green color. Polychromatic stains are those that have a compound dye or dye mixture that contain components of different colors. The term polychroming refers to the process in which a dye forms other dyes just spontaneously. In some histopathology laboratories, polychromatic stains are used as routine stains for bone marrow biopsy sections. The polychromatic stain that we will be discussing in this lecture is the May Grunwald of Gimza stain. The May Grunwald Gimza stain is used to differentiate the cells in hematopoietic tissue. So hematopoietic tissue is tissue that gives rise to blood cells. So the formation of blood cells is called hematopoiesis. So uh, where this is occurring is called the hematopoietic tissue. The preferred fixative of this stain is either Zanker or B5 solution. 10% uh, neutral buffered, uh, buffered formalin is acceptable, although it's not preferred. Tissue, tissue section should be cut to four to five microns. The quality control slide should be a spleen section as the spleen is a secondary hematopoietic tissue. The procedure for the May Grunwald Gimza sustain is as follows. You want to deparaffinize, then hydrate to distilled water. If the tissue is fixed in a zanker or B5 solution, it's going to contain mercury pigments. To remove these mercury pigments, it needs to be placed in Lugol iodine for five to 10 minutes. Wash in tap water and then add sodium thiosulfate to remove that iodine. 
Then it needs to be washed in running water, then rinsed with distilled water. It needs two changes of absolute methyl alcohol, and each of those changes needs to be three minutes long. After this, it needs to be stained in Jenner solution for five to six minutes. Then, one slide at a time, it needs to be transferred directly into a working Giemsa solution and remain there for 45 minutes. After that 45 minute period, the slides need to be rinsed in distilled water quickly, then differentiated in 1% acetic water. At this point, it needs to be checked microscopically to make sure everything is working properly, and then rinsed in distilled water. It then needs dehydrated, cleared, and mounted with synthetic resin. When stained properly with the May Grunwald Gems of Stain, nuclei and any bacteria if present will be blue in color. The cytoplasm of white blood cells or leukocytes should be shades of pink, blue, or gray. And this, this color variation is dependent on what type of white blood cell it is. This photo on the right hand side of the slide shows a section of bone marrow that is properly stained using the May Grunwald Gems of Stain. Sometimes tissue sections are looked at by pathologists without mounting, uh, but the large majority of the time the sections must be cover slipped. There are two types of mounting media uh, for um, putting these cover slips on, a resinous media and aqueous mounting media. Resinous media is the preferred method. Um, there are natural resins and synthetic resins. Natural resins set slowly. Um, they are acidic and are dissolved in xylene. Um, they do tend to fade some stains with long time storage. Now the preferred resins to use are the synthetic resins. So these harden much quicker than the natural resins. Um, they do gradually fade the blue components in the Romanowski stains over time, uh, but are generally good for prolonged storage of sections. The refractive index must be slightly below or above that of the tissue to have good visibility. Aqueous mounting media is used when dehydrating and clearing processes will adversely affect the stain. These media include simple syrups, gum arabic media, and glycerol gelatin. The refractive indexes uh, in these are very different than of the tissue, so the transparency is not as good when mounting with resin. So these are not mounted for permanent storage. Cover slips are applied to most sections to help preserve the stained section of tissue. These allow for better microscopic examinations by the pathologist. There are a lot of different techniques for cover slipping, but in general, it's okay as long as there are no air bubbles trapped between the tissue and the cover slip. If this happens, the slide should be returned to xylene to remove the cover slip and then reapplied. Any excess mounting media needs to be removed after cover slipping. This can be done by dampening a brush or gauze with xylene if removing synthetic resin or water if using an aqueous media. There are automated cover, slips of, uh, cover slippers available, but it is important to be able to know how to cover slip manually. So what are issues that can occur when mounting stained sections? So there can be water bubbles present, as you can see here in the photo on the right hand side of the slide. See all these bubbles present in there? So this is uh, something that you want to prevent. So this is caused by the sections not being completely dehydrated before clearing in xylene or a xylene substitute. So to prevent this, you want to make sure to change all the dehydrating and clearing solutions before staining. Now, if this has already happened, so to correct this, um, the cover slip needs to be removed um, as well as the mounting sections, um, and you can do this with xylene, and then it needs to be returned to fresh absolute alcohol. After the dehydrating step, it needs to be cleared um, uh, with fresh xylene and remounted. If all areas of the section cannot be focused with a microscope, this usually indicates that there is mounting media on the top of the cover slip. To prevent this, you just don't want to get mounting media on the cover slip. So if this happens, you want to remove the cover slip glass and remount it with a clean cover slip. Corn flaking is an artifact that occurs when sections are allowed to air dry before they are mounted. This shows up as a uh, this granular brown pigment that you can see here on this photograph. So this is what I'm talking about here. Right, that granular um, brown pigment. Um, so to prevent this, you don't want to allow it to dry before mounting it. Um, if this has already occurred, you want to remove the cover slip and mounting media with xylene and then return it to water to rehydrate it and then clear. Um, and you want to make sure to keep the slide wet with xylene and then remount it. 
Sometimes the mounted sections are not as crisp as they usually are when viewed under the microscope. So troubleshooting this involves checking to see if the mounting medium it, uh, used is too thick. So if this is found to be causing the issue, the cover glass and mounting medium should be removed with xylene and then remounted. And lastly, sometimes the mounting medium will retract from the edge of the cover slit. So this is shown in the example on the right hand side here. So if you see this here, right? Um, so see how it's kind of retracting uh, from the lower right hand corner. So the cover slip is pulling up and retracting from uh, the slide. Um, so most of the time this is caused by a warped cover slip or a mounting medium that has been too diluted. So if this occurs, um, you want to remove the cover slip and mounting medium with xylene and apply a new one. It is also good practice to keep the cap over the mounting medium on tight so that way it doesn't get uh, diluted. Alrighty, so that's it for our nuclear and cytoplasm staining lecture. Um, hopefully you're still with me here. Um, if this video helped you, go ahead and give it a like, and please make sure to subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. And as always, if you have any questions about this lecture, feel free to leave them down in the comments. I try to respond to everyone um, as quickly as I can. All right, until next time, lab rats.